He's Marvel's first mutant, Bane of Wakanda, and Adolf Hitler's worst nightmare? This is Namor the Submariner. Namor first appeared in 1939's Marvel Comics No. 1, in which he is established as an enemy of humanity from the very beginning. In his underwater kingdom, Namor comes upon two salvage divers who he is convinced are robots, due to their strange garb. He kills both divers and brings their bodies back to his people. Once he peels the diver suits off his victims, revealing they weren't robots after all, his mother in particular praises Namor for what he's done. She tells him humans almost caused their kind to go completely extinct, and that she has long meant to wreak vengeance upon them. By the time he gets his own series with 1941's Submariner Comics No. 1, Namor's vengeance has become focused on the Nazis. Hitler orders Namor's undersea home bombarded by U-boats, killing many of his people, including the Emperor. Submariner Comics No. 4 was published just a month before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and when Submariner Comics No. 5 was released in late 1942, Namor had made the Japanese his new targets. Sadly, the subsequent stories didn't exactly mark Marvel's finest moments. Like many comics of the time, Submariner comics featured offensive depictions of the Japanese. They're so bad, in fact, that Namor's old colleague Spitfire comments on them, as she browses through a stack of old comics in 1991's Namor the Submariner No. 19. If you haven't heard of Namor, there's a good chance it's because he's so often overshadowed by DC Comics' more well-known aquatic hero, Aquaman. The two have a lot in common. They're both underwater heroes, both are the product of a union between humans and fictional undersea people, and each is the heir to the throne of his respective version of Atlantis. Even though they've both worked on the side of the angels, they also each tend to harbor at least some sense of antagonism towards the surface world, though Namor clearly dominates in that department. All of this has led to the false belief that the Submariner is merely a clone of his more popular DC counterpart. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around. The Submariner first showed up in 1939, while Aquaman didn't surface until More Fun Comics No. 73, which was released in 1941. Aquaman undoubtedly enjoyed more fame than Namor over the years, even beating him to the silver screen. I am the protector of the deep. I am Aquaman. Still, there's no need to point fingers. The 30s and 40s saw comic book publishers trying any and every gimmick they could think of. It isn't that much of a stretch to assume two different comic book creators could have conceived of similar aquatic heroes without ever seeing one another's work. Namor the Submariner was the creation of Bill Everett, who was reportedly a descendant of the poet William Blake. Poetry had a key role in the creation of the character, too. Everett's daughter, Wendy, once said in an interview that Namor was based on the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, she explained. Everett had read Coleridge, and this background gave the characters a very erudite wholeness. In tribute to the character's origins and inspiration, 1993's Namor the Submariner No. 44 loosely adapted Coleridge's poem for the comic book page. Everett conceived of the Submariner while working for Funnies, Inc. The character was initially planned as part of a promotional comic that would be given to moviegoers at theaters. That idea was scrapped, however, and instead Everett used it for Marvel Comics No. 1. The hero was a hit, and Everett would go on to write and draw Submariner stories in a number of other titles. Everett took a break from Namor for many decades, but eventually returned to his stories. He ultimately ended up writing and drawing the character until the end of his life, working on Namor's stories in Tales to Astonish and Submariner in the late 60s and early 70s. Everett passed away in February 1973. Submariner No. 61, Everett's final issue, was published a few months later. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. These days, Marvel Comics has no end of line-wide events, which draw together heroes from all over its universe. Even though reading the whole story usually means spending more money, crossovers remain popular. Part of the reason they still sell is because they affirm the idea that Marvel's fans are plugged into a large, complex fictional world. And it could be argued that Namor helped create it. Many superhero comics in the golden age of the 1930s and 40s were anthologies. Rather than featuring stories of one hero, they were roughly three times longer than a modern comic book and offered readers multiple stories, each one starring a different character. In 1940s Marvel Mystery Comics No. 8 through 10, two of the title's heroes, Namor and Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch, meet and lock horns in battle. This meeting confirmed that their stories took place in the same world, and is often considered to be the story that established what we now call the Marvel Universe. 
One of the more contentious debates fans fielded over the years is whether or not Namor is a mutant. He was, after all, born with his powers, and not all of his abilities can be explained by his shared Atlantean heritage. For example, while Atlanteans are naturally stronger than humans, Namor is even stronger. Also, Namor can fly, which is not an ability most Atlanteans share. On the other hand, one major Marvel crossover seemed to counter the argument that he's a mutant. In the 1996 line-wide event Onslaught, Namor is among the many heroes to sacrifice themselves in order to defeat the villain Onslaught by charging into him after the Hulk cracks his armor. When this happens in Onslaught Marvel Universe No. 1, it's said that this is only an option for non-mutant heroes because Onslaught would be able to possess any mutant who tried it. Well, Onslaught is defeated and Namor isn't possessed. Regardless of past inconsistencies, however, Namor's mutant origins are now set in stone. He even joins the X-Men in the 2012 line-wide event Avengers vs. X-Men, having a year earlier enjoyed a brief solo title, Namor the First Mutant. Recently, he was invited to join the rest of Earth's mutants on the mutant island of Krakoa as part of the Dawn of X event, but declined. No, you didn't see him fight the Nazis in Captain America the First Avenger, but in the comics, the Submariner was right there alongside Steve Rogers and his allies as they attempted to lend some superhuman weight to the struggle against fascism. Wait, you know what you're doing? Yeah, I've knocked out Adolf Hitler over 200 times. The World War II-era team was originally called the All Winner Squad, but this was later retconned. Now the team that helped retake Europe from Hitler is known as the Invaders. Ironically, the team has enjoyed more modern comic book appearances than they did during the Golden Age of Comics. Before the 60s, the Invaders only appeared together in two 1946 issues of All Winners comics. In more recent years, though, there have been multiple limited and ongoing series that revive the team in one form or another, not to mention extensive flashbacks in different issues of Captain America. As recently as 2019, Marvel released a new Invaders series, which sees Namor's old teammates try to stop him from waging war on the surface world one more time. Superheroes fell out of fashion after World War II, but when Marvel got back into the cape business in the 60s, the company didn't forget its roots. Even before bringing Captain America back into the fold, Marvel established the return of the Submariner. Right away, it was clear that the Marvel Universe's citizens wouldn't welcome Namor quite as much as they would Steve Rogers. In 1962's Fantastic Four No. 4, Johnny Storm intervenes when he sees a group of men harassing an amnesiac homeless man. When the angry men offer to beat the memory out of him, Johnny shocks them by revealing that he's the Human Torch. The comic then gives us one of the most iconic images of the Silver Age, the Human Torch giving a homeless man a fiery shave and learning that he is actually the Submariner. It turns out that this encounter isn't enough to jog the aquatic hero's memory, so Johnny flies him over the city and drops him into the ocean, correctly assuming that the return to his natural environment will awaken his memory. Unfortunately, in doing so, the Human Torch accidentally creates one of the Fantastic Four's greatest foes. The Submariner's first act upon regaining his memory is to summon a giant sea monster to lay siege to Manhattan. Thus ensues the first of many battles between Namor and the Fantastic Four. You fascinate me. I have never known a female like you." Although Namor has more recently become the nemesis of Wakanda, the character has remained most closely associated with Marvel's first family. The Fishman and the Fantastic Four have duked it out across multiple comic book titles, while their feud has been depicted in animated shows and video games. Unsurprisingly, Reed Richards and the gang consider Namor to be one of their most dangerous foes. The King of Atlantis, however, wants only one thing from the superhero squad, Sue Storm's love. Reed and Sue's marriage can get rocky at times, and the Invisible Woman has been known to flirt around with Marvel studs such as Black Panther. However, the connection between Namor and Sue seems to go much deeper than that, as the Atlantean has always pined for his fantastic foe, while Sue often runs to the sea whenever marriage troubles arise. Although it is not confirmed if Sue has ever officially cheated with Namor, they doubtless share an emotional attachment, one that never bodes well for the Fantastic Four. In the days leading up to Civil War, it was revealed that a group of superheroes known only as the Illuminati had been working behind the scenes ever since the kree scroll War. In 2006's New Avengers Illuminati, we see the meeting that brings together Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Mr. Fantastic, Black Bolt, Professor X, and Namor to form this clandestine group. 
Black Panther is the sole invitee to decline, although he joins years later when the group reforms in New Avengers, welcoming a few new members at the same time. From the beginning, Namor is one of the loudest voices of dissent, and it's partly because of his objections to Iron Man's initial vision that their group goes underground. One of the group's more infamously terrible decisions is the exile of Bruce Banner from Earth, which leads to the events of Planet Hulk and its explosive sequel, World War Hulk. I know you must hate us, Bruce, but you always said you wanted to be left alone. May you finally find peace. While Namor is often considered to be the least intelligent and most hot-headed member of the Illuminati, in this case, he's the only member to vote against Banner's exile, and arguably the only one to make the right choice. The dispute over this issue explodes into a fistfight between Namor and Iron Man and ends with the Submariner prophesying Banner's return. Along with the Hulk and Doctor Strange, Namor the Submariner was one of the founding members of the Defenders, the superhero team founded in 1971's Marvel feature number no. 1. In fact, even before the Defenders were formed, Submariner's adventures were pivotal in laying its foundations. In 1971, Roy Thomas wrote the two-part Titans 3 story in Submariner No. 34 and 35, the tale united Namor, Hulk, and Silver Surfer, and in a 2013 interview with Back Issue, Thomas said that these were the three heroes he originally wanted to be the Defenders. He replaced Silver Surfer with Doctor Strange because of Stan Lee's insistence that no one should write the Surfer but Lee. Between 1971 and 1972, Namor, Hulk, and Strange appeared as the Defenders in Marvel Feature No. 1 through 3, and finally in 1972's Defenders No. 1. The lineup remained unchanged for only a single issue, after which when Stan the Man apparently changed his mind and the Silver Surfer joined the team. In the early issues of Defenders, Namor often warns his teammates to not bother calling him for help again. Ironically, despite his objections, he continues to help them out over the years, including in the 2018 mini-event, The Best Defense. Namor has a few powers that don't show up much in the comics. Everyone knows he can fly, he has super strength, and obviously he can breathe underwater. But that's certainly not the limit of his amazing abilities. One such ability is his electric eel power. Namor can direct electricity through his body from an outside source and blast an opponent with it. We see him use this power for the first time against Doctor Doom in 1962's Fantastic Four No. 6, and he also uses it against the Human Torch in Strange Tales No. 107. Many years later, in the middle of a cover-to-cover -cover brawl with the Hulk in 1977's Defenders No. 52, the Submariner uses the power again. It disappears once more until 2002's The Order No. 3, when Namor redirects one of the Wasp's bioelectric bolts at her teammate Captain America. More recently, Namor has revealed a new power, control over water. This new ability made its arguably non-canon debut in the 2001 miniseries Fantastic Four 1234, but returned in 2019 for Invaders, in which Namor reveals that he has stolen in this power from Hydro Man. Thanks to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, audiences are quite familiar with one of the comic universe's most powerful weapons, the Infinity Gauntlet. Holding the six Infinity Stones, the gauntlet becomes a conduit capable of destroying half of the universe. In actuality, the weapon is capable of nearly anything, as it can bend time, souls, and even reality itself. What did it cost? Everything. Understandably, this kind of power would be tempting for anybody, and especially for a king who dreams of ruling the entire world. However, when Namor had the opportunity to take the Infinity Gauntlet, complete with all six Infinity Gems, he actually passed it up. Namor the Submariner was given the chance to pick up the all-powerful glove in the 2015 comic event Secret Wars. In this story, Namor and Black Panther discover the Infinity Gauntlet on a secret island. Thankfully, the Submariner is self-aware enough to know that he would inevitably use the weapon for evil. Black Panther slides on the gauntlet himself and uses it to attack Doctor Doom in the event's final battle. Namor has spent decades proving his capacity for heroism. He has fought alongside the X-Men, the Defenders, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and even with the Invaders against the Nazis. But there is no place on Marvel's Earth where the name Namor is more synonymous with villainy than in the African nation of Wakanda. Twice in the past decade or so, Namor has directly contributed to massive cataclysms in Wakanda, invariably leading to thousands of deaths. In 2012's Avengers vs. X-Men line-wide event, Namor is one of the five mutants who make up the Phoenix Five. Along with Cyclops, Emma Frost, Colossus, and Magic, Namor is imbued with part of the Phoenix Force. When Namor tracks the Avengers to Wakanda, he uses his newfound power and his armies to unleash the ocean on Wakanda, murdering untold numbers of Wakandans. Two years later, in New Avengers No. 23, Namor betrays the Illuminati and helps form the Cabal, 
a group made up mostly of villains such as Thanos and Maximus the Mad. Together, they slaughter a number of alternate Earths in order to save the prime Marvel reality, and they also conquer Wakanda, leading to, among other things, the death of Shuri. Namor eventually turns on the Cabal, but neither the people of Wakanda nor Black Panther forgive him for his crimes. Though the comic book version of Namor has enjoyed a reputation as a defender of the Earth, his first outing in Black Panther Wakanda Forever leans more into his villainous history with the people of Wakanda. The Submariner is set to make his live-action debut in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. His arrival on screen has been a long time coming, much longer than you might think, in fact. Surprisingly, there have been talks about making a live-action adaptation of Namor's story since the 1950s. Originally intended to star Richard Egan, a Submariner series was to be produced in 1955 off the heels of the successful Superman TV show. Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman! Unfortunately, the series never made it to air. The King of Atlantis almost made his big-screen debut in 1997 when talks began for a movie directed by Philip Kaufman. This film adaptation would be bounced around among studios, writers, and directors for several years before nearly being realized in 2004. Although the Namor movie was still in early production until 2009, the film failed to materialize. With Universal in possession of the character's film rights, the MCU was unable to bring one of its oldest characters to the big screen until contracts were clarified in 2018. Finally, the Submariner was nearly included as a member of the Illuminati in 2022's Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. By then, though, Marvel Studios already had plans for the character. Black Panther Wakanda Forever was chosen as the setting for the Submariner's debut in the MCU. That said, there are a few key differences between this version of Namor and the one who exists in the comic books. For one thing, the team behind Wakanda Forever have decided to adapt Atlantis into a Mesoamerican-themed aquatic kingdom, called Talokan. Former Marvel artist Anthony Francisco told Looper that the inspiration for the Atlantis redesign came after watching a documentary about Mesoamerica. He said, I was thinking, how do I put technology together with the folklore and the gods into what Namor is and the civilization underneath? These designs have helped add one more nation to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and with Namor's long-awaited arrival, it's likely that the Talokan people are sure to make a splash in a number of other upcoming MCU projects.